All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, retro gaming and Java and Raspberry Pis and 3D printing. So hopefully one of those topics is interesting. Um, same ground rules as Sebastian. If you, if you have questions, go ahead and ask them. We like questions and you'll get, you'll get rewarded. Oh, and we probably should have said this at the beginning, but um, <coughs> so my my Twitter handle is um, Steve on Java. Oh, I did. You may have to write the Twitter handle. <laughs> yeah, so the the E goes in the middle there. Um, Sebastian is. See, I can I can do yours better than mine. <laughs> I don't write my own Twitter handle, right? You never need to write your own Twitter handle. You just write other people's Twitter handles. Okay, and then also, <coughs> um, I, as part of my job as community manager, I run the Java Twitter handle together with Yolan, and we have the night hacking, although it has an underscore here. Night hacking Twitter handle as well, um, and there's probably other Twitter handles. But so if you if you guys um, send a message to any, including any of these Twitter handles, mention that you're at the meeting tonight, and then I'll follow you back from all of our Twitter handles. So this is a good way to get you'll you'll get at least four m new followers <laughs> just for playing. Um, okay. So as I mentioned, I do community management for my day job, and this is a this is a very hard job. There's 314 Java user groups. Well, probably more than this now. This is slightly outdated. You guys are all Java user group members, so thank you. Thank you for supporting Java user groups worldwide um, and making a difference in Japan, especially. There's nine million Java developers, so you guys are in good company with m plenty of Java developers. 150. Java champions throughout the world. We need more Java champions in Japan. Help us with this. And um, about 50 of the jugs are also contributing to the JCP. So if you guys are not yet a Java user group contributing to the JCP, you could you could let Heather know that you'd like to contribute. Right? Now, yeah. all right. So we have new new thing for the jug to do. <coughs> Sorry. Um, okay, but this, this stuff is all hard work, but, um, we're gonna, we have something which is really hard. Okay, so as I mentioned, that's nice that it's kind of playing back. So we have something that's just really hard, which we'd like to do, which is, um, NES emulation. So I guess in Japan, this would be the Super or the Famicom, not the NES. Um, so together, the NES, which is what they called it in the U.S. and Europe, and the Famicom sold 61 million units worldwide. Who had who had a Famicom growing up? Anybody? Super Famicom? Yeah. Okay, a few. Um, what what was your favorite game to play? What was the name of it? Who line? Robot game. Oh, okay. That sounds like fun. <laughs> Very good game. Okay, cool. All right. So we have some good retro gamers in the audience. There were a total of 826 different ROMs created for the original Famicom. So lots of different games to test. Um, the chipset was a Motorola-based chipset. I think that deserves a sticker if you didn't already get one. The chipset um, had 3,510 transistors. It was a Motorola-based chipset. And to accurately emulate the NES, you need um, 92 million synchronization points between the CPU, the PPU, the pixel processing unit, and the APU, the audio processing unit. Because the problem is they're not... 
they're not perfectly in sync, so they use little timing differences between the um the chips to create games. So um you know, doing all this work is very hard. You spend lots of time playing video games and testing games. So um I spent I spent a lot of time pl hard at work playing video games. You guys know this game, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure in Japan which games were came over here and which games were only in the US or Europe. But this one was called Ninja Gaiden. Yeah. Maybe. Okay, but this is one of the top five hardest NES games. Um, how about how about this one, Mega Man? <laughs> uh, so I think in Japan, like Rockman, Rockman, yeah. In English, they renamed it Mega Man. Okay, so this is Rockman, and so Rockman One, the first one, was very hard, very challenging. Later on, they made it they made it easier. Actually, this I think this in general this is a problem with video games. So my 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 daughter is. Uh, what's what's today? Tuesday? Wednesday? Wednesday. Okay. So as of yesterday, <laughs> my daughter is now 13. I, I missed her birthday to do this tour. <laughs> <laughs> but um, she she plays video games at home, and you know they they always are very rewarding, and they're easy, and they they give you lots of um, clues as to what you're supposed to do next. The original games where they were frustrating. Bad controls, very difficult monsters, impossible end bosses. Like that's that's what makes a classic retro game. It has to be impossible. That's how you're a real man. So this isn't an, an, a Famicom game. This is a Super Famicom game. But anyone recognize this? R-Type. -type. Okay, very good. Um, so after you're playing all these video games, eventually you reach Nirvana on gaming and then you you discover <laughs> so so who knows what this is y you know what it is yeah. ah okay konami code okay so very good so you you look like you're a a, a gamer so i'm going to challenge you <laughs> so i have i have a game console to lend you this is a um a homemade game console, and we're going to try a competition. Have you played Super Mario? Okay, Super Mario. We're going to play the first level and do a speed run, see who can go through it faster. So pass this back to him. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use another console, NetBeans. It's a, it's a pretty good gaming console. You can play lots of, lots of fun games with NetBeans. Program lots of fun games with NetBeans. So I'll be running the same code base as you. Okay, so have you? It sounds like it sounds like it's working. So we're gonna we're gonna. Yeah, yeah, see, so I'm playing here, and you play there, and we see who gets to the flag first. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's separate. Yeah. All right, ready? All right. So we need somebody to count down to um, count three, two, one, go. Who wants to? You got it. All right, go. All right. I got off to a slow start. 
Oh, I'm gonna run and... Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, I need my power up. There, not much better. So you know there's a hidden one up around here? Yeah. You have to get all the secrets, too. Well, maybe you don't. And Starman. Oh, no, that's not Starman. Where's Starman? It was somewhere around here. Oh, well, I missed it. How are you doing? Almost there? Oh! <laughs> Still alive. All right, at least I made it past the halfway point. You made it? All right, give him a congratulations. <laughs> All right, so that, that definitely deserves an extra sticker. Give him an extra. Extra. Well, yeah, extra sticker. Okay, so um, we'll pass the, pass the gaming console. Yeah. So, you know, play a little bit and then pass it to the next person. Um, this is the gaming console, which you just got to play a little bit with. So it's, it's 3D printed. And um, I did a custom design for the, the case. Inside of it, it has a Raspberry Pi. And it's running all Java technology. So the software is a Java-based emulator. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, electronics first, and then a little bit about the software, and then we'll talk about 3D printing. So first, the electronics inside of it, it's using a uh, Raspberry Pi. Who, who has a Raspberry Pi? Ah, yes. Very good. Um, have you done any interesting projects with your Raspberry Pi? Maybe. Like, um, you hook it up to your TV? Or wh what do you do with your Raspberry Pi? How do you use it? Oh, Minecraft server. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's much too slow. So I was mentioning my 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 daughter um plays video games. She also runs a Minecraft server. And to keep up with her and her her bad friends, we have like a quad quad core computer <laughs> running the server and it's still not fast enough. So play, maybe playing Minecraft is easier than running a Minecraft server, I think. Um, the Raspberry Pi actually it has a really good GPU, so you can run um, 3D applications on it quite well. It has um, HDMI output, Ethernet, a bunch of USB. The micro SD card acts like a hard drive, and then you have micro USB for power. So it's a good way. The Raspberry Pi is a really good way to get started with um, doing embedded development. So for our Raspberry Pi experts, do you guys know what these two ports are on top of it? Who knows? Who knows what either of these are used for? Okay, so the GPIO pins are over here. It's a little hard to see them. Um, these are little, they, they have little cables which slide in. Ah, touch screen, yes. Very good. So, and the other one is the camera. So the Pi Cam. Um, and the touch screen is, it's nice. It's like a big seven inch touch screen that's made by the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Um, obviously, 
it doesn't fit in that case with a seven inch touch screen. So I needed to come up with a different option. So here are some different portable display options that you can use with your Raspberry Pi. Um, so a lot of people will use composite displays, like little mini composite displays, but the quality is not very good. You can also use small HDMI displays, but um, one of the problems is it consumes a lot of power to convert it back to um, from an HDMI signal to an LCD signal. And my, my daughter's requirements for the gaming console was that this lasts a, a long car ride, right? If you don't have enough power to last for a long car ride, it's a failure as a gaming console. So that was about six hours. And if I was wasting power on this, I wouldn't be able to, to hit my target. Um, actually, the, the runtime of this console, it runs about six and a half hours. I tested it. So it's just, just enough to keep my daughter happy for a, a nice family vacation. Um, you can also use SPI as another input. This is a serial peripheral, high-speed serial peripheral interface. And it's, it's very good and it's very fast for connecting devices up. For screens, it's not fast enough. So you only get about 10 to 15 frames per second. Um, and to do accurate NES emulation, you need 60 frames per second. Um, and the last one is device tree support, which it's a nice hack. You add a device tree file to your boot sector, and then you can remap the, um, the, the pins coming off the Broadcom chip to different pins on GPIO and headers. And you can actually replace the GPIO pins with LCD pins. So um, once you do that, you need to then take the GPIO pins and map them to an LCD header. So Adafruit, who sells a bunch of um, small embedded hardware, they make a board called the Kippa, which is very simple. It just remaps the pins. Um, and this works quite well. So this is what I'm using inside of this. Um, it also will power the display off the 5 volt from the Raspberry Pi, so you can just power it directly. And it also supports touch, so you can have a touch screen. The disadvantage is you don't get to use any of the special buses, and you just have six plain GPIO pins. So, um, to, d impl to implement a controller, an NES controller, how many... How many buttons do you need? How many pins do you need to implement a, an NES controller or a Famcom controller? Eight? Yeah, correct. You need eight pins. Yes, sticker. So NES controller has A, B, start, select, and then four directional arrows. So fail. Yeah, six, not good enough. So if you play the Mario and you get to the end of the first stage, you rescue the Toad and yeah, try again. So when my daughter played this for the first time because I gave her the console to test and she'd never played Mario before, she beat the first level, the first world, and she got here and she was almost in tears. Because if, if this was a modern video game, there should be like dancing and fireworks and a big celebration. Not, not this sort of very, very cruel. But I think this, this, see, this is why we have character. We grew up and we, we have, you know, character and, you know, the younger generation, they're spoiled. <laughs> okay, so here's the um, solution I came up with to, um, to use six GPIO pins for eight buttons. So since you can't press left and right at the same time, I hook them both up to the start button. And so um, if you press the start button, it's the same as pressing left and right simultaneously. And if you press select, it's the same as pressing up and down simultaneously. And this way you can kind of hack around the problem um, does anyone know why, what the diodes are for? Yeah. 
Why why diodes? See, so I guess you guys are computer science experts and this is like a electrical engineering question. <laughs> But basically, diodes um, only allow current to flow one direction. And so if you didn't have the diodes here and you pressed um, left, it would also press right. So the diodes prevent you from having current flowing through. It can only pass one direction from start to left and right, not the other way. Um, so this is what the wiring diagram looks like for the board. Here's the button layout. I did the initial button layout on a breadboard and some soldering, uh, my messy soldering job. And now you have a um, working electronics. Okay, so now to play games, we need some software on this, right? So what I used for the emulator, since you know I'm the Java community manager, it has to be Java based is half NES and half NES is a pure Java implementation of um, the original Famcom slash NES code base. You could play any ROMs on this hardware and it'll accurately emulate them. Um, so you just set up NetBeans for remote debugging and then you deploy to your Pi and then you're you're up and running. Now you have software running on the Pi but there's a small issue, which is the original NES or half NES code base was not really optimized for Raspberry Pi. And so it runs at six frames per second out of the box. So not very good. So I um, spent some time in NetBeans doing profiling of the half NES code base. And here were some things which I came up with for performance improvements. Um, one thing I did is I, I originally it was using Swing and it was um, going through X windows for the display. And I switched it to use JavaFX and JavaFX has direct frame buffer support, so you can bypass X windows. So this alone is, you know, a huge performance improvement. Maybe, you know, graphics system is like easily four, four or five times faster. Um, also, I went back to an older code base. His, his new code base does things per pixel. And I switched it back to synchronizing per line instead. So it's less accurate. It breaks um, Codemasters games. So the guys in the UK called Codemasters made some horrible hacks in their games. Um, but most other games work other than that one company. Um, I also replaced some bitwise helper functions with um, Boolean operations or logic operations and um, and that was much faster because it got rid of an extra method call everywhere in the code base. Extracted some PPU operations out from once per line to once per screen. Replaced some double math with long math because it's faster on the Pi. Um, I also tried this. I tried to replace array access via unsafe. Do you guys know what unsafe is? Yeah. So basically, you can you can access memory directly using the unsafe classes, but it's not supported. Um, the APIs can go away in any future Java version. Um, and actually, it turns out it it didn't actually help with performance. So the the just in time compiler is pretty good at optimizing code, and I was trying to be smart in removing array bounds checks, but it I did a lot of testing and it didn't affect performance. Um, same thing with this. There's actually an intrinsic for replacing loops with system array copies, so that also is not needed anymore. Um, the last one I changed is the audio, pulse width modulation audio. And um, the Raspberry Pi audio buffer flushes are very slow whenever you flush audio to the, um, the audio subsystem. So I changed it so it only flushes once every three to four frames. 
Um, that's good for music because it's fine. You don't actually need to be playing music very real time. Not so good for sound effects. So it does slightly delay the sound effects, although you can't really tell when it's only three or four frames. Because it's 60 frames per second, so that's like one fifteenth of a second. So it's still very fast. OK, and last thing is um, 3D printing. So printing the case. I think this is the, the most fun part, but also the most challenging. <laughs> um, does anyone have a 3D printer? OK, but maybe soon. I think you, you need a 3D printer. So this is the printer I use, the Ultimaker. Um, it's a very reliable, high quality printer made in the Netherlands that uses a Bowdoin tube style design. But I think the, the best attribute of it is the company which makes it has a fully open source design. So they published the specifications for the machine. And they also have open source software that they run on it. So the slicing software I'll show you later, Cura, is open source. And they have a large community of folks using the printer and um, making improvements to it. So if you're, if you're looking at a 3D printer, I would look for a company which has a good community and an open design. It makes it much better to use than if the company is, has like a closed design and you have to send the printer back to them for support. That's very difficult to troubleshoot your own printer. For example, the um, when I got the printer, it was missing a bracket um, to connected to the Bowdoin tube. So it's still printed, but there's a little bit of slop in the Bowdoin tube. And I contacted them and they said, ah, we'll be happy to ship you a replacement part from the Netherlands to the US. Or here's the file, you can print it yourself. And so I printed the part, and I stuck it in, and then fixed the printer myself. And I think the, this printer, you can basically take apart and reassemble yourself and fix everything, which is very good. Um, the software I used is called Fusion 360. So it's from Autodesk. And they have a free student license, if you're a student. They also have a free um, hobbyist slash startup license. So if you're not making money on your project, then you can apply for a hobby or startup license and use it for free as well. Um, and it's much easier to do stuff in Fusion 360 than, for example, SketchUp or other design tools, because this is designed so that you can just draw the model once with the proper dimensions. And then you specify operations like extrusions or rotations or chamfers. And then you can always go back to the original drawings and change the, um, the measurements, and it'll update the design. Um, so it, I designed this over the course of two weeks. And um, I kept going back to earlier steps and changing things as I printed it, because I would print a copy each day. And then I'd look at it and see what was working and what wasn't, and give it to my daughter, and she would break it and then try again. So I think there's a lot of trial and error with any project. So it's, it's much better if you can modify the design easily. This is what the inside of the case looks like. It has um, several different parts which snap together like um, a jigsaw puzzle. Um, one of the challenges was getting a good hinge design. So this is some failure hinges. Um, and there's a good reason why most like if you open a DS, a Nintendo DS, it has metal hinges inside of it. And if you were manufacturing a game system, you would always do something like that. But I wanted this to be something that was 100% 3D printable other than the electronics. So um, my original design was like a polyhedron with um, 20 sides, a 20-sided polyhedron. And then when you would rotate it, it would snap at different positions. Um, the problem was I gave it to my daughter and she would open and close it. And after a few dozen times, it was perfectly smooth. <laughs> All the hard edges rounded off. Um, so it's very difficult to de design a hinge. 
You guys see this screen a lot? I think when I was a kid, I, I was um, traumatized by this game. Because it, it wasn't very friendly. It was a Nintendo game, but it was very difficult. For maybe, I don't know, what age I was when I was playing it. Um, so I came up with a, a different hinge design, which uses two triangles that are um, co-centric. And then the triangles are slightly different sizes. So this little gap here at the top is the, the minor difference between the two triangles. And so what it creates is it creates a, an oblong triangle shape. Like it's not, a, it's not a, a perfect circle. It's like a triangle with rounded corners. And so this, this sort of shape is going to be happy at exactly um, three positions, right? Every 120 degrees, it will be perfectly aligned. And when you're 60 degrees off, you have overlap with the um, enclosing area. So this red area is um, in Fusion 360, there's an interference mode where it'll show you overlapping material. And so when it's 60 degrees off, you have 28.254 cubic millimeters of material that's overlapping. And so this was about the right friction. And you can feel it with the hinge if you open and close it. it it'll stay shut like that. And then when you open it, you get a little resistance, and then it stays open. And the, the reason this sort of design works better in plastic is because rather than having a sharp edge, you have, um, you're asking the plastic to bend slightly. And plastic can bend and then return to the original shape many times. So this is a much more stable design for plastic. OK, so I, lots of little challenges like that when you're designing something. But I think this is fun for a hobby project to try doing something like this. Um, this is the software I mentioned, Cura, for doing the slicing. So this is open source software from Ultimaker. Here is a 3D print in progress on my 3D printer. Um, this shows some of the pieces being printed. Um, in total, there's, I forget how many. What is that? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven pieces that are 3D printed. Here's the buttons. Um, I kind of fan out the so it's a little bit flatter and fits in the case. And then you solder to the buttons. And then you put the Raspberry Pi in the bottom of the case. It has a special slot with tabs to hold things in place. The battery is a 4,000 milliamp hour battery that'll run the Raspberry Pi for about six hours, six and a half hours, including the screen, Raspberry Pi on screen. Um, I'm using a board in the back called the Adafruit Power Boost. And this is how you get the lights in the back. So if you notice on the back of the case, there's little cutouts for lights and it tells you power, charging. Those are all LEDs which are on the board already. And that board um, has a micro USB for charging. It will charge the battery. It'll power the Raspberry Pi. And it also connects to the power switch so you can turn it on and off easily. Um, there's also a joystick and some buttons, a little amplifier board with the speaker, and then the remaining buttons go on top. So you kind of layer this on top of each other. Put the ribbon cable through here. And that's an extension board which connects to the top of the display. These are the pins on the side I mentioned with the oblong shape. And you notice there's a little cutout here. And there's another little cutout right here. So those are for locking pins. So you can put them in from the side and then lock them from the top. Um, so again, like there's no screws on the case. Everything's designed so it snaps together in interesting ways to stay together firmly. Um, there's a few areas you have to remove material, which is designed to make it possible to print without supports. So the entire case will print without any supports on any printer, but you have to break off a little material here and here, which is there just to make it easier to print. And then um, there's little rails on the side that things kind of slide together and um, fit nicely. And that's the finished project. So 
Um, I have one last video clip. You guys play this game? Yeah, Metroid. So did you did you beat Metroid with a good ending? You have to you have to get all the items. I think you have to get all of collect all the items in the game, and then you get the good ending. And then you find out that your um your character who's there your character's in a sp you you know the answer to this. <laughs> your character's in a spacesuit. So you don't know that your character is actually a female rather than a male. So actually, this is one of the f earliest video games which had a female main character in a spacesuit. <laughs> so I guess that's technically cheating. But I think this is a good model for um, having more women in programming as well. Um, I do a bunch of kids' workshops. And there's a very good ratio with children. My daughter also helps me teach. It's usually 50-50, sometimes 40-60, girls to boys. Um, but then somewhere as they get like high school and college, it drops off a lot. So um, don't, don't stereotype your, your kids. Let them, let them have fun and do technology stuff. Um, this is the, the book that the project's from. Um, the, the publisher made us, or actually Oracle made us, my company made us change the cover. <laughs> this was the original cover design with the Raspberry and Java, and we ended up with this. <laughs> but we got we got a Duke. We got the little Duke icon there. So we, we won. This is not standard Oracle practice to put Duke on books. Little little wins. Okay, so um we're gonna we're gonna give you guys two copies of the book. Um but we're going to decide who gets a book by asking you a question. And then whoever gets the question right can c take home the copy of the book. And I'll ask one question, and Sebastian will ask the second question for the other book. So you have to think of a question while I'm asking mine. Yes, yes, of your presentation. OK, so for my question, Let's see. Ah, okay. I have a tricky one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll show the page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. Yeah, so this one is number one. Um, it was related to the code base because he rather than rather than the normal way to do bit masks is you have a like a bit mask and you say zero 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 one whatever and then you end that with your number and you check if it's equal to zero. Um, he had a function where he was passing in the long and the position and returning back a boolean. And it was that inside that function, it was um, using a bit shift, a loop and a bit shift to get to the right position to build the bit mask. So <laughs> that was slow. And I, I did a regular expression and replaced the whole code base with um, bit masks. And it was much faster. And that was in like thousands of places in the code base. So it was quite invasive. The second biggest improvement was the video. Okay, good question. Okay, now it's turn for my question. <laughs> I get to ask you guys a question. So um, remember I showed the diode thing? Diode, diode, yeah, this one. 
Okay, so there is there's a case where this doesn't work. There's a there's a combination of buttons you can press which will cause this to not work. So, which buttons do you have to press simultaneously and then to, to make it fail? Well, to make the buttons not input what yeah not registering the button input Yeah, yeah. So the um, the the wiring. The question was what the exact wiring is. So basically, the way these buttons are wired is one side goes to ground, one side goes to the GPIO pin, which tells whether it's high or low. Um, um, and so because I only have six GPIO pins, I I have um, no GPIO hooked up to start, and instead I hook it up to left and right, so it press it, it's like it's pressing both buttons simultaneously. Um, so the specific wiring for this was that high was off and then low was when you pull it down to ground is when it gets registered so anyone want to take a guess ah yes yes very good so let me restate the answer um, so basically if you press the left and the start button simultaneously, when you when you press start, that's the same as pressing left and right. So now when you press left, left is already pressed and it can't register. So the Raspberry Pi will think start is held down even though you're trying to press left. And so normally this doesn't matter because you'll never press start or select and left or right, except with one game, Mike Tyson's punch out. For the smash moves, you're supposed to press, I forget what the combination is, but like it's up and left or in select or something weird. Um, and that breaks. You can't do that on this setup. So, book for our attendee. Very good. Give him a round of applause. That was a tough one. <laughs> All right. And you got to. You get to do one, Sebastian. Yeah, now I got another challenging question from my presentation. So that's probably harder because you have to remember <laughs> an hour ago. So um, if you remember, I used some functionality from JaxRS to create uh, URIs programmatically with information from JaxRS. And uh, specifically, I used one specific class from JaxRS. Can you tell me the name of that class? Yes. Your eye info. Very good. Very <laughs> good. You get a book. <laughs> All right. That was very fast. That was yeah, that was really fast answer. Really All right. So I, I put up some resources on the slideshow. Um and these are some specific links which we recommend um especially for the Japanese audience. Um so we have a OTN Japan homepage, Java magazine, which is a publication that comes out bi-monthly and has lots of articles. Um, there's a person in our Oracle office who translates this into Japanese for you guys. So please, please put his hard work to work, to effort. Um, 
There's also a Java developer newsletter in Japan, and we have all of our Java SE documents in Japan, and we have Java software downloads as well. So please check out these um, URLs and resources. Okay, and um, I think we wanted to do a picture. What what else? What else do we have, Ido-san?